Well, it's great to be here with you, Peter. Um, I should say at the outset, for those of you in the audience who don't know Peter and his career, that he was one of the people whose job uh, in terms of AIG was to put Humpty Dumpty back together again. He wasn't one of the guys who gave it a great fall uh, at the beginning. Um, so um, Peter, let me just start by asking uh, a kind of what are you doing here um, picture. <laughs> Uh, you, you the, the, the historical view of the crisis and how it impact, how a, and AIG's part in it has been reduced to something of a soundbite now, something running to all the bad trades, AIG was the counterparty. Uh, m maybe you can take a minute just to set the record straight about what kind of crisis AIG had, and then we can talk about your role in helping it recover. Well, I think, uh, first of all, thank you very much for the opportunity to talk about something that's obviously uh, near and dear to my heart, and, uh, and I really uh, appreciate the comments we've heard so far. This has been a really uh, informative uh, uh, discussion, and very uh, pertinent to what I, I wanted to say, and uh, Debbie's uh, comments I couldn't agree with more, that the accounting for the cost of the bailouts uh, has been all over the map, and the level of understanding of uh, the ins and outs of AIG, the pros and cons of what happened, whether it was a victim or a perp, uh, has really uh, uh, muddied the waters in terms of uh, my job uh, in trying to, as you say, put uh, Humpty Dumpty back together again. <laughs> in other words, to continue to serve the millions of uh, customers around the world that relied on AIG for its services and to recover as much value as possible for all of the claimants. Um, so. Uh, so I think that you know, with the perspective of 10 years, uh, we are away from the heightened uh, venom that occurred uh, in the year before I joined. I joined in February 2010, and it was a year before that that several uh, employees had death threats, their children were beaten up in school, the employees were spat at in the street. So this was a company that was vilified. The brand was literally uh, as low as you can get which I, I believe was unjustified. Uh, clearly, um, uh, there were, were many things that could have been done better, but I think that this was, as I think everybody has said so far, a systemic crisis, and the sequence of institutions that were toppled by the liquidity crisis was somewhat random. Mm. And so there are other large institutions that relied very heavily on, on the uh, assistance from government that ended up with very uh, modest impact on their brands. Um, that's, um, I, I think, an important backdrop because uh, you can get very quantitative about the pros and cons of the bailout, uh, whether it could have been more efficient, uh, but forget about the, the human dimension. And at the end of the day, institutions are made up of people. Uh, Bob Merton talked about the importance of trust. And I think whether it's trust within an institution, between employees, between employees and their um, and their, their management between shareholders and, and a company, or regulators and a company, uh, the level of trust in AIG collapsed. Mm. And I, I think that's an important uh, backdrop uh, for thinking about how you restore trust in the aftermath of a bailout to recover as much of the going concern value as opposed to resort to the liquidation value of, of the company. But I think it's fair to say that a lot of people were surprised by the kinds the many kinds of risks that what they thought of as a general insurer were taking. What they found, what, what part of that anger was just, we thought this was an insurance company and it seems to have <clears throat> a trading operation attached, floating freely from the basic risk transfer function that companies like that are supposed to have. Is, was that a misunderstanding as well? You know, I, I think that <clears throat> for those that were better informed about the company, they recognized that this was a company that was in insurance in about 200 countries in the world of all forms. It was one of the two largest aircraft lessors. It was one of the largest uh, commercial property developers around the world. It owned banks. It was a financial conglomerate uh, with industrial holdings. It was very diverse in, in its activities. Um, I think the biggest surprise was that how could something that was rated AAA so recently suddenly be out of cash? How could something with a trillion dollar balance sheet going into the crisis not make a collateral payment 
to Goldman Sachs and other banks that were calling for collateral. And I think that the uh, surprise was this sort of mismatch between the, the, uh, the uh, degree of uh, unquestioned confidence that its balance sheet had had fairly recently, before the crisis, to the sudden collapse of that confidence. And, and that, I think, is worth examining as, as to how do we prevent that misplaced confidence in very large institutions. Well, well, go, well <clears throat> why don't you go ahead and answer the good question you just posed. Uh, with 10 years of hindsight to think about it, how could a company of that size and that degree of diversity go from triple A to bust? So I, I think that one of the things that I uh, really learned coming into the industry from out of the banking industry in my uh, earlier career was quite how balkanized the regulatory framework is for insurance companies. Mm. So um, AIG uh, was regulated by well over 200 different regulators <coughs> who jealously guard the capital ratios and liquidity of their legal entities. And so when a, the holding company has to come up with collateral, uh, upstreaming cash via dividends from those various subsidiaries, uh, A takes time and B takes the agreement of a lot of stakeholders, uh, notably regulators. So um, understanding that a frictionless model of enterprise risk is an abstract rather than a practical concept was an important learning. And I think especially our banks have moved to a more ring-fenced structure. So the stress tests need to be much more uh, precise in evaluating the frictions that inhibit the free flow of capital and liquidity between geographies, between functions and, and legal entities. And so, so it, it's more complex than perhaps some of the simplified enterprise risk models that were applied uh, would suggest. Well, we still have some very complex and diverse and large financial institutions with multi-trillion dollar balance sheets. And as a fi financial analyst and as a reporter, I still flip to page one and I look at the consolidated balance sheet to assess the financial strength under stress of the organization. Is that itself a risk? And how do you handle that risk? So I'm thinking of, you know, j pick your institution, JP Morgan's balance sheet, it, you know. Uh, I, I th clearly size brings with it broader systemic consequences. Does it increase the probability of failure? And I'd say no. Uh, mm. it, uh, larger institutions can usually afford better um, investment in things like cybersecurity and uh, probably uh, more money spent on stress testing. And so, so to some extent, scale brings with it safety. Yes. Um, but obviously, the, the, the uh, severity of the societal impact of a failure is greater. I think more than size, complexity is an issue. Mm. And more than size is a convergence of business model. And so uh, I think that the attempt to uh, standardize capital models uh, and uh, the, uh, the failure to distinguish between beta and sigma uh, mm. in the way in which risk is evaluated uh, has not rewarded institutions to specialize. So if you look at most large financial institutions, they tend to share very similar risk uh, profiles. And I think the stress test initially started to tease apart the two mm. by saying, what is the relative exposure of different institutions to exactly the same scenarios? In subsequent stress tests, I saw a more eclectic mix of risks thrown into the, into the pot mm. of those stress tests. And I think you lost a lot of information value when you did that. Mm. So, so obviously, uh, an interesting stress test in 2006 would have been what was the exposure of each of these institutions to a spike in uh, mortgage defaults? Yes. And, and that uh, beta to, to mortgage defaults would have been a useful thing to benchmark against companies and would have been a different answer to whether they were capitalized at 8, 10, or 12 percent. Uh, mm. Because... Um, you know, I, I think isolated defaults of even large institutions, if they're the only institution exposed to a given risk, has a fundamentally different impact on the system than a simultaneous default of many, which is, you know, I think going back to the earlier conversation about the smaller banks being exempt, mm. if they're all exposed to the same risk, uh, 
if they all go down together, that's a problem. Think about you know, the Texas banking crisis of the 80s with the oil price exposure. So I think that you know, we need to think uh, carefully about mushing together vol measured by sigma with, with beta uh, and, and really have uh, um, better incentives to have more specialized, simpler institutions. Because mm. I do think that um, supervising rating uh, large complex institutions is a huge challenge to both the regulators and the rating agencies. And so, so I, I, I don't um, underestimate how hard it is, and so making it easier for them to do a good job would be a good thing. It's one of the remarkable features of the 10 years since the financial crisis that the institutions have, may have changed, but the rating agencies and the structure of the rating process is substantially unchanged. So are you, I mean, when you, call, when you call for a kind of ecosystem of financial companies that is more specialized and diverse, are you suggesting changing the industry because the rating agencies are too hard to change? <laughs> or is it too, too hard to rate complex institutions or there's not a better way to think about risks? You actually have to change the institutions themselves? Well, I think you know, the, the question is, um, are we solving for reducing systemic risk? Mm. Are we solving for um, optimizing uh, uh, shareholder value? Or are we optimizing, for, uh, optimizing for, for enterprise value? And I think the answer is slightly different depending on those things. Because I think yes. the rating agencies are worrying about the debt holder. Um, mm. And I think that uh, they could do a better job uh, for the debt holders of large financial institutions, but I think the moral hazard dimension is that uh, the debt holders of large financial institutions assume that there will be a bailout. Mm. So I think that, the, you know, but uh, I, I do believe if the rating agencies said, look, we have absolutely no clue whether these large banks should be rated single A or single B because they're just too complicated, then I think you'd have an incentive to greater simplification, mm. and that wouldn't be a terrible thing. Uh, because I, th I think that the rating agencies are the de facto regulator of these companies. They are embedded in financial contracts. They trigger collateral terms. Uh, and so I, I think that we have to sort of judge whether over those 10 years, the critical role of rating agencies in rating institutions, not structured finance, because that's where a lot of the critique of the rating agencies fell, mm. but in the institutions themselves, has it really adapted to the difficulty of really uh, evaluating uh, the, the credit where these come uh, absent the contingent bailout. Talk about the work you had to do to protect value for the various shareholders at AIG. Substantively, substantively, when you landed there, what was the work that needed to be done and how did you decide to do it? Well, you know, I arrived in February 2010. Um, my uh, CEO at the time, Bob ben Moshe, had arrived about uh, seven months earlier. And um, you know, the first thing was to sort of look around and see um, who on the sort of leadership team uh, was uh, able to, to sort of come to the, to the rescue. Mm -hmm. And I was uh, very pleasantly surprised by the quality of the team that was, was on deck. And that was, that was critical because the pace at which decisions had to be made was enormous. Uh, mm. We had, a, I think, 120 board meetings in one year. Mm. And many of them were at midnight. It was yeah. an absolutely <laughs> extraordinary pace. Um, and so it put great strain on that. There was no bureaucracy. You had to, to get to the substance of issues. We were extremely lucky in the counterparts at the New York Fed and the US Treasury that we faced off against, uh, Sarah Dahlgren at, at, at the Fed and Jim Milstein at, at, at Treasury. And so evaluating who were the players that we would be dealing with uh, really um, helped to shape uh, what were the degrees of freedom to come to a solution. The other thing that was clear, going back to the trust issue, was that I had made the naive assumption when I joined was that the counterparty was the government. And anybody who's dealt with the government is there's no such thing. There are multiple departments within the government and because the nature of the bailout of AIG occurred pre and post TARP legislation, um, there was multiple ways in which the assistance had been provided. And each of them had different governance and different objective functions from being senior secured creditors, from being TARP preferred. And so we had 
a stakeholder group, including public shareholders, the float never stopped, mm. debt holders and so on, and a rating to maintain, um, that meant that the capital structure that would be uh, feasible in the long term had to be designed with the uh, cooperation of all these stakeholders. And when we arrived, we were stuck in a world of zero-sum thinking, going back to our, our first uh, talk uh, th uh, this morning. And we had to persuade people that the whole was worth more than the sum of the parts, that everybody needed to compromise. And so we came up with this concept of a peace dividend, mm. which intuitively everybody could get. You know, if only everybody could compromise just a little bit, give a little bit, then the enterprise value would go up and, and help everybody. And Interestingly enough, we applied uh, the work of uh, Bob Merton's contingent claims approach to estimate what that peace dividend was worth. And um, we uh, worked with uh, Andy Lowe, in fact, and mm. uh, used a jump diffusion model to show that if you could reduce the probability of a reversion to a fire sale, mm. you had about $13 billion of value to share among all of the stakeholders if you could only reach a, a sustainable going concern capital structure. Mm. And so that was a, a very helpful ap application of theory into a very sort of intuitive human dynamic of how do you get people to buy into collective action when that was essential. And you know, in contrast to some of the other bailouts where action was deferred and deferred and deferred, we were able to shift to a strategy of preserving a core of the business, selling off dozens of companies, unwinding trillions of derivatives, de-risking the company, and focusing on a going concern, and keeping 60,000 employees excited about continuing to work there by virtue of um, getting that cooperation to happen quickly. Because every quarter that went by that they, the issue was not resolved, customers were departing, employees were departing, is a melting ice cube. So, Speed was of the essence. How much of the effort of realizing what you called the peace dividend came down to just getting creditors or claimants to be patient? I mean, was it a matter of, I know you're first in line, but if you can just wait, right, we can you know, talk about the human element a little bit. I, of I that, think, of I think realizing that, that. that sort of preceded the peace dividend and really coincided with the arrival of Bob, Bob Bermache. And mm. there's a wonderful C-SPAN video of him testifying in Congress, uh, looking um, at the congressional panel in the eye and saying, we will repay every dime of the bailout. And mm. people just laughing in his face, mm. literally laughing in his face. Because that, at that moment, the CBO was estimating a loss of 40 billion. And so the, the ultimate uh, simple uh, <coughs> Uh, cash flow approach, which uh, Debbie dismisses, but we, <laughs> our, our good president at the time used, so I'll use it, uh, was, was that it, it was a net positive of, of 23 billion. Mm. Um, so 182 billion, but uh, the 23 billion more than that paid back. And, but in a relatively short period of time, that was all done by uh, November 2012. Mm. So, so I think um, it was fairly compressed. Um, but, but, I, but I think that uh, the, the key point was the when Bob Ben Moshe had that conviction, it started to resonate with employees, with customers. And so rather than you know, the peace dividend, and that was just saying that the mean of the distribution just jumped up by about $40 billion from a fire sale liquidation under the previous regime mm. to this is worth saving. Even if you can't save all of it, you can at least save some of it. And the part that was saved is still the largest insurance company in the world. You've just taken away a lot of the other uh, distractions that caused a lot of fear. The uh, derivatives trading business, the aircraft leasing business, the consumer finance business, the bank, things that pose contingent liquidity risk that probably didn't belong in an insurance company group. Mm. Your bailout happened two days after Lehman? The, um, Tell me about the impact on the process of the order. You talked about the order being somewhat, or the order in which companies got into trouble and got bailed out being somewhat arbitrary. 
from where you know where, where you were sitting? Well, you know, I think that ex post with lots of time, we can say, well, the AIG bailout was pretty effective. It got the money back. The shareholders and the management got punished very severely. Um, should be uh, you know a perfect prototype for future bailouts. Mm. I think anybody who was there at the time would say you've got to be crazy. <laughs> you know, this was an incredibly complex uh, uh, process. So there's got to be a simpler way to do it. And I think that um, the sequence meant that every day that went by, the the level of fear of a massive contagion was going up. Mm. So the willingness to go to ever more extreme measures to just put the fire out got greater. Mm. And uh, the ability to take risk, political risk, I would say, in making very unpopular choices rose. And we'll hear tomorrow from some of those decision makers. I have huge respect for the uh, policy makers that stuck their neck out and did what I think was the right thing, even if you could uh, be a Monday morning quarterback and question the precise way in which it was done, inaction would have cost uh, society far more in my view. Mm. And so I, I think that this, the sequence um, meant that uh, there was uh, heightened fear that this would really go out of control if it wasn't done. Um, because I don't think anybody really expected to have to deal with an insurance company for heaven's sake. Yes. Um, but you know, obviously um, Goldman and, uh, and, and Lee, uh, Goldman and uh, Morgan Stanley becoming bank holding companies a week later was another implicit bailout. So the, it, it, it kept on cascading, but in different forms as the, as the weeks progressed. L let me put Professor Lucas's challenge to you directly that if I understand her reading of the true cost, the economic cost of the bailouts correctly, is that as it were, insurance was extended at a time when that insurance had a lot of value that on a risk adjusted basis, there was economic losses associated with the bailouts. What do you think about that critique? I well, hate to tear you away from President Obama's no, accounting no, system. No, no, I, th I think it's a very legitimate approach. I think that, you know, I think the, her last bullet point was the point that you can look at the aggregate cost of the bailout um, uh, in a cost-benefit analysis and say, uh, in the counterfactual of not doing any bailouts, what would have been the cost to society? So I think the, the externalities of a failure of all of these institutions, starting with Fannie and Freddie, the FHA, uh, and AIG and, and all the major banks would have been absolutely catastrophic. Mm. So I think it was a bargain, um, but uh, you know, could it have been cheaper? For sure, I think a lot of prudential math, um, things could have been done differently in the preceding years. And, um, and, and, and so I, I think that uh, specifically to AIG, and obviously that's where I can speak uh, most candidly, I, in, in the years that I worked there, which is over seven years, I met with customers in over 50 countries who thanked me uh, and thanked the company for continuing to exist because they would said they would be out of business without AIG's insurance. Mm. It, it, it insured hundreds of thousands of businesses, tens of millions of people all around the world and was a critical part of the, the fabric of international commerce. And so, so, uh, so I think that it was um, a company worth saving and, uh, and today is, uh, I, I think, a more focused, more specialized company than it ever was. Mm. So l let's say pan out from AIG to um, the financial system generally. Before you were at AIG, you were involved in the derivatives business and banking business. With 10 years uh, of retrospect, lessons learned, lessons failed uh, to learn. Well, you know, I think you know, I was uh, at J.P. Morgan between 1980 and 2000. I was an entrepreneur between that period of time and and ending up uh, at uh, Key Corp after their uh, assistance and then at, at AIG. Um, so during that period of time, I saw uh, a lot of changes in the way financial instruments that I had been involved in, um, swaps and, and uh, credit default swaps and so on, were used. Mm. And I think like any powerful tool, uh, they can be very uh, useful, uh, but they can also be quite destructive if, if misused. And I, and I always felt that, um, that CDO technology was ill-suited to repackaging mortgage risk because going to my point about Sigma and Beta, um, they essentially rely on diversification as a risk uh, tool. 
And when you've got 1,000 mortgages in Arizona, adding another 10,000 doesn't add to the, distribu it add to the, the diversification. No. And so I think that um, having a, a, an effective um, futures contract mm. uh, to be able to hedge the systemic housing risk uh, would have been a helpful um, uh, alternative way to recycle that risk. Uh, but I think that the industry went down a different route, which is to take a technology which was better adapted to sovereign credit risk and corporate credit risk and apply it to mortgages. But mm. you know, I, I think that um, the other thing which I have really come to appreciate much more and I you know, experienced in the early part of my career in the 1980s uh, is legal enforceability risk. So when Hammersmith and Fulham, uh, the local authority in the UK, um, was determined to be uh, acting ultra virus uh, when they were in entering into interest rate swaps, suddenly the banking industry was exposed uh, to having unenforceable contracts to all of the local authorities in the UK. And, um, and likewise, late in the 90s, uh, when, um, when there was a risk that all over-the-counter derivatives would be designated as unenforceable off-exchange futures contracts, there was a risk of enforceability that would have been even more catastrophic. And I'm not sure that stress tests today sufficiently look at counterparty uh, legal enforceability as opposed to credit risk because uh, jurisdictions uh, will determine whether these counterparties will pay and they may be whole groups of them. So I think that um, greater attention to legal enforceability because I think that the aftermath of the crisis gave rise to a lot of litigation around that um, and, and I'm not sure that's been fully appreciated. So, so simplifying um, the, the books of business, you've still got many of the large banks with tens of trillions of notional. That's not the right metric of risk, but it's a starting point for saying, okay, uh, let's, let's get to the bottom of where the risks are, including legal enforceability risk. Mm. Uh, well, when we talked yesterday about taking questions from the audience, mm -hmm. we concluded that you never know what kind of nutcase shows up to an <laughs> event like this, and we decided not to. But I got an email from Peter this morning that said the nutcase ratio seems to be relatively low, <laughs> and it uh, might be safe to take questions from the audience. So uh, <clears throat> with that uh, in mind, would anybody like to uh, put a question to Peter? <laughs> not you. <laughs> <laughs> Insurance companies, I was a customer for a while. I mean, they're okay, right? They're well. A counterfactual for the bankruptcy of AIG, uh, would you have been able to limit it to financial products and the corporate parent? What would have happened to the, it's hard to speculate about the markets, obviously, but what would have happened to AIG? So it, it's obviously a speculative argument, but I'll, I'll mention one thing, and there's a nice paper published, um, I forget the um, professor's name, um, I can dig it up, about the fact that the securities lending uh, activity that occurred within the regulated insurance company was facing a loss almost as large as the, um, as the unregulated uh, derivatives activity at the holding company. So the simple answer is the risks of liquidity uh, mismatch and um, uh, the ability to meet collateral calls would have been not only at the holding company but deeper into the insurance companies. And, uh, and so I think it would have been much more painful than, uh, than some people think. Um, and you know, the cross default clauses are uh, something that also people, you know, a lot of people talked about, oh surely you could have got a better deal on the collateral and so on. You know, if you start, haggling about you know, getting haircuts, you immediately start triggering cross defaults and then how many other forms of debt start to cascade and you can't finance yourself. So, so I, I think that you know, that's, that's hindsight thinking. Um, it's not a simple corporate bankruptcy where you can negotiate haircuts with lots of time. Uh, 
it's, it's, a, it's a wholesale financial market where you're rolling over debt every night. And once you start triggering cross defaults, there's no going back. So I, th I think that uh, the answer would have been it would have been uh, toast. Technical time. Please. <laughs> the, the, the microphone will come over shortly. Thank you. Uh, I'm Lillian from PIMCO and also an MIT graduate. Um, thank you very much for sharing your insights. So I especially like your comment about the rating agencies and the importance um, of rating agencies to act as supervisors for companies. So um, since financial crisis, we have observed that rating agencies have been, um, have, have been more tolerated of higher leverage in the corporate world. So this is especially um, uh, pronounced during the um, QE period, which is understandable because of a more um, supportive macro environment and also lower interest rates. So going forward, um, say if in the future we, um, we encounter another crisis, do you see a larger chance of the history to repeat itself or do you think that the rating agencies will be more constructive next time in terms of warning people of potential risks? Well, I was, um, and is anybody here from a rating agency here? <laughs> you know, I'm going to give them a plug. You know, I think that for especially large financial institutions or any borrower that has large amounts of debt, they could get away with charging roughly 10 times more than they currently charge. I'm astonished by how little the rating agencies charge and how much do they underestimate the economic value of a good rating to a counterparty. And I think that that means that they just simply don't have the resources to do the kind of analysis that would be really helpful to a sophisticated institution like PIMCO. So I'm assuming PIMCO has more than enough analysts to do their own homework and don't rely on, on, the, on the rating agencies uh, because I think uh, today they're still massively under-resourced to do really good work and in particular to estimate the impact of a change in monetary policy, the change in the yield curve, uh, the impact of unfunded pension obligations uh, and, the, and the potential ALM mismatch of, of asset allocation within the, in, in pension funds. These are things which I don't see in the typical ratings uh, 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 reports uh, analyzed to a degree of, of accuracy that I think are going to serve us if we get a regime shift. Um, so I think they, they tend to be rather backward looking uh, and extrapolating recent past as opposed to capturing inflection points. Um, I'm Gordon Liu from HSBC Risk Management. Thank you very much for sharing your thoughts. The question a little bit specific uh, for uh, the CDS, that's the products offer for corporate CDS from uh, AIG at the time. So given the insurance normally have millions of people to do that insurance, but for corporate CDS, you can liquid about a couple of thousand in their part. So my question was, what kind of uh, discussion was dis uh, debating internally, I know it's before your time, why that product being offered? Because apparently, uh, if you offer too expensive, nobody buy too cheap, you could multiple defaults for one contract. So uh, additionally, for all the other products, what kind of um, due diligence that's within the company been doing that? Okay, thank you for answering this. So I, you know, as you point out, I wasn't there at the time. Um, so I'm not sure who asked what question. And I, I, there may be people here who were there. Um, most audiences of this size have at least one or two uh, AIG uh, uh, employees uh, in them. Um, but I'll answer the question in broader terms, which is that you're right. Insurance works best when you have thousands, if not millions, of uncorrelated risks. And, um, and I think that there are certain forms of insurance that don't have that. And so I'll give you some examples. Uh, one is the variable annuity business in, in the life side, where you have uh, substantial systematic risk to interest rates and equity markets and equity volatility, uh, which by adding another million uh, individuals doesn't go away. It's, it's a, and so the traditional actuarial reserving methods don't properly capture that. So that's one example. Mortgage insurance. Uh, AIG was the owner of United Guarantee, which became the largest mortgage insurer, quite separately from the CDS. This was an insurance product regulated by insurance regulator 
um, again, the systematic exposure to, to housing prices was not captured by the traditional actuarial methods. So I, I think that um, you know, there are other areas uh, in the surety insurance business, which is effectively a credit product, where, again, traditional actuarial methods don't properly capture systematic risk. And so you, you're raising an important point, which is how, how do you properly apply uh, reserving and, uh, and accounting and, and risk management techniques uh, from a functional as opposed to an institutional perspective, because you have the same functions being performed by banks, insurance companies, mutual funds. Uh, and so I think having consistency across function as opposed to by institution prob is probably the best uh, way to prevent unexpected uh, exposures to occur. Uh, we have time for uh, one more question, and I'll disappoint the audience and ask it myself. Okay. Because, it's, uh, <laughs> because it is uh, relevant to the answer you just gave. <laughs> Uh, a major insurer just lost its status as a systematic, uh, systematically important institution. It's the second large insurer. I've spoken to both, and the line I get from both of them is we only got into this terrible situation of having this designation because of those dummies down there at AIG, and it was unfair all along. Uh, what do you think about the decision of regulators to move those bit large insurers out of the, the systematically important bucket? Well, you know, this was a topic of, of quite a lot of um, uh, debate when I was the CEO um, and an activist campaign, to be honest. And I argued very strongly that being a SIFI was not an impediment to the uh, success of the company, importantly because uh, AIG had de-risked itself and insurers tend to have rather low uh, leverage ratios compared to banks. So under the SIFI regulation, that was absolutely not a constraint on what was a, a, a strategy to focus and return capital to shareholders. We bought back about $23 billion of stock without any bumping into any SIFI constraints. So you know, I think that a lot of the concern about SIFI or no SIFI is more of an ideological one mm. as opposed to a practical one. Uh, it's for sure an additional level of cost. But as I mentioned, AIG had over uh, 200 regulators, every single US state, every foreign jurisdiction, many cases, multiple regulators in each of them, having just one extra one was not that much extra work. And so, you know, I think it's much ado about nothing. Um, I do think having an overall primary regulator makes sense. Once the Fed exited from AIG, once it was de-designated, New York State took over that role. So you have to just ask yourself, you know, is the system better with the New York State uh, Department of Financial Services as a global regulator or the New York Fed? Thank you for me in thanking Rob for his fantastic questions and Peter for his Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.